Recently, Bishop Bryan sent out a link from workingpreacher.org on the importance of preaching at Christmas. Doesn't the readings, the music, and every holiday, mu every holiday movie since Halloween tell us everything we need to know about the meaning of Christmas? I mean, what more do we need to know? Well, recently I got hooked on a TV show on True TV. It's called Adam Ruins Everything where a comedian who's named Adam Conover talks about all the things that we think are true that are actually completely wrong. Some of these can be mind-blowing. He's very funny, but he's also very well researched. So one of the things I like about him is he provides citations for every major statement he makes. The one that I watched this last week, of course, is Adam Ruins Christmas. <laughs> The episode starts with Adam and his sister, Rhea, who is feverishly trying to get ready to host her first Christmas in her own house. She's trying to make the perfect Christmas for her parents to prove that she's a capable grown-up, and in the process, making herself a little less in the Christmas spirit the longer it goes on. Adam has been camped on her couch for a year, getting his life together, and instead of helping her with the cleaning, the decorating, the Christmas shopping, or virtually anything, he stands around, getting in the way, and constantly interrupting her about why what she thinks about Christmas is wrong. He thinks he's being helpful because he's explaining why she doesn't re really need to do any of the things that she's doing, and she just wants to kill him because everything he does just wastes time she doesn't have. I'm not going to go into the details of the episode, but it's available if you want to look it up on the internet, and I highly recommend that you look it up on the internet, because it's really funny. The part of the episode that really struck me was the way that Adam could know more about the story and its inaccuracies and completely miss the meaning. For example, Adam points out that the birth of Jesus seems to be at a weird time. For one thing, why would baby lambs and shepherds be hanging out in the fields in the dead of winter? Wouldn't they be, like, trying to stay warm in a pen in town? There are plenty of pagan winter festivals, like Saturnalia and Yule, that either mark the solstice or are close to the shortest day of the year. And Christianity just seems to have jumped on the bandwagon. In fact, the earliest writings about Jesus don't even mention Jesus' birth at all. And even in Luke and John, the date really isn't important. Up until at least the late 200s, there was no celebration of Christ's birth at all. It wasn't until the 4th century that December 25th became widely associated with Christ's birth. Built into the earliest theology of the church, is a focus not on Jesus' birth, but on his crucifixion and resurrection. Judaism taught that there was a cyclical nature to the world, and that great things could be expected again and again at the same time of the year. Early Christians understood that to be that Christ's birth and death were linked, that he was literally born to die. Creation and salvation, birth and resurrection. For them, the birth of Jesus could not be separated from the sacrifice of his death. The early church believed, therefore, that Christ was conceived on the same day that he was crucified. Nine months from Passover would have been December 25th. Unless you use the other version of Passover, which would have made it January 6th, which means that that's why we have Epiphany, but Eastern Orthodox have, you know, just a really late Christmas. We don't argue about anything, really. But <clears throat> in most pictures of the Annunciation, Mary and the angel are accompanied by a small Jesus carrying a cross. Before Jesus is born, he is focused on us. His gift of redemption is the central message of the birth of Jesus. 
Many things we associate with Christmas are, in fact, older pagan celebrations. Cyclical patterns of death and rebirth are certainly not unique to Christianity, but our understanding of what that means is unique. As Christians moved into new areas, they had to try to explain what the meaning of Jesus was using the metaphors that people around them could understand. Some of the trappings of Jesus are connections to older pagan festivals, new metaphors to explain ideas that transcend words. If Christianity was going to speak to the people, it had to use the words that the people knew. An evergreen was a good way to explain the constancy of Jesus in the midst of the winters of our lives. Jesus was not just a historical person, but a living presence in our lives, ever-growing and evergreen. A Yule log could be used to explain the spirit of Christ living within us. Just as a tiny coal can still light a bonfire, Christ's spirit, born in a manger in Bethlehem, could start a movement that transforms the world. The original flame lives on, even though it may be all new wood. Using the metaphors of daily life was one of Jesus' strengths, and Christianity continued to try to emulate him in that as they brought the message to new people. Adam decides that celebrating Christmas was just a way of making it okay to maintain the people's old pagan drunken festivals while dressed up in new Christian trimmings. In some ways, that probably was true. But it's certainly not all of the story. We are constantly trying to help people understand why Jesus is central to our lives. When we do things in Christ's name, we are reenacting a new metaphor. Making soup for the community is not simply cooking. Celebrating St. Francis Day is not just supporting no-kill shelters. Telling the story of Christ using what you have at hand, just as the early Christians did. Anything alive has to be able to change and grow. Language, culture, and belief have to grow as the people grow. One of the strengths of the Christian faith is its ability to transform itself to speak to different cultures and different times. As we have been reading the Street Bible by Rob Lacey, I have noticed that changing the story into everyday language has not cheapened the story. If anything, it has enriched it. Telling the story of Jesus in a new way deepens the experience for both listener and speaker. Tell the story your own way. Think of our own culture and the ways in which we can use those metaphors to explain our faith to people who do not understand it. The Grinch, for example, is a powerful way of explaining the cost of being selfish and the joy that can come in sacrifice that redemption is possible no matter what you have done. Those stories speak to the child in us, which is why they are so memorable. Tell the story of what it means to have Christ living within us. In 1965, a Charlie Brown Christmas was broadcast for the first time. Charles Schultz had to fight to be allowed to have Linus read the Christmas story because it seemed a little churchy. Now it is probably the first explanation of the meaning of Christmas some children get. The story of giving and forgiving and of coming together to help others is not just confined to a King James Bible. Amen.